I'd like to give our audience a big warm welcome today. And thank you so much for joining us for our Ocean Awards lecture series today. And we are so excited to have Danielle Shaw presenting for us and hosted by the event by our Vice President of Research, Dr. Peter Ross. And I would like to start off today's program by saying how grateful I am to be teaching and living and learning on the traditional and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people here in Vancouver. And it's through the best practices of observation, oral history, storytelling, and looking after the nature and the place that you're in that ocean-wise research, conservation, and education can really incorporate that into our programs like the one today. And so we're so excited to be here connecting to Danielle, and I will turn it over to Peter to tell us a little bit about the great awards that this whole program is brought to you by. Thank you. Welcome everybody. Delighted to be here live from Bowen Island uh, here uh, adjacent to Vancouver uh, today on this uh, online rendition. The first time the Ocean Awards have been held online for obvious uh, reasons. So thank you for joining. Uh, it's also being recorded. So uh, this uh, program can be uploaded to, to the YouTube channel and viewed in the future. So uh, the audience is growing as I um, as I uh, uh, as I look at my screen, but um, I just want to uh, start by uh, uh, reiterating the uh, the gratitude um, to our uh, our the communities uh, here uh, at uh, Slaywithu, Squamish, and Musqueam. Uh, we work very closely uh, with uh, with those communities, but also many other communities up and down the coast. And uh, indeed, a lot of those partnerships are very humbling uh, and very very important. Of course, uh, at this time uh, in our very strange history, um, if, if I can put it that way. The Ocean Awards were established in 1995 as uh, an honor, a tribute to uh, the founding executive director of the Vancouver Aquarium, that was Murray Newman. Uh, they were established in 1995. And what that means is that this is the 25th annual uh, uh, rendition of the Newman Awards. Now we call them the Ocean Awards. Uh, and we're very, very excited uh, about uh, the the ranks um, of uh, of uh, custodians of uh, this year's awards. We announced the awards a couple of months ago at an online event, uh, and that was an online event that some of you may have attended, uh, where David Suzuki accepted the North Medal for Lifetime Achievement, uh, and we had a very stimulating talk by him. Uh, and then we committed to uh, uh, providing a, a, a creative. Uh, uh, um, hard hitting uh, agenda uh, from each of our uh, awardees. Uh, our first, um, our first award winner past the uh, Dave Suzuki um, uh, presentation uh, was the Coastal Guardian Watchman, uh, who many of you may uh, understand to be uh, important custodians of uh, natural resources in our coastal waters. Uh, and they spoke uh, last Thursday. Uh, and then we have uh, an agenda every week for the next few weeks. So we look forward to you joining us. Now, today's star, Chief Danielle uh, Shaw. Hello uh, and welcome. We're delighted to have you with us today. Uh, we're delighted that, uh, that you accepted our nomination, be which we provided to you uh, in, uh, uh, as, uh, in, in keeping with Really, the the wonderful uh, personal professional history that you've uh, you've managed to to uh, shape up uh, for um, the the world around you, uh, and you are uh, um, uh, being uh, awarded the Murray Newman Award this year for significant achievement in aquatic conservation for a number of reasons. But I should point out that while we bestowed David Suzuki with the North Medal, which is a lifetime achievement award that we only established about four years ago. The Murray, two single most important awards in our OSHA awards, uh, in my view, uh, because they date right back to the original 1995 ceremony, Murray Newman Awards for Significant Achievement in Aquatic Conservation, 
uh, and its counterpart uh, for research. And so, Danielle, you are being honored today, this year, uh, because of your dedicated uh, work in support of marine protected areas, uh, your integration, uh, your integration, uh, integration frameworks uh, in, uh, involving uh, different ways of know knowing, and of course, uh, the very important uh, and timely uh, Indigenous ways of knowing that uh, that I think add a substantial value to the way in which we look at the ocean and the world around us today uh, in this region. Um, your contributions on the sustainability files uh, involving uh, policy and advocacy, uh, and of course, your political leadership at the Wakino, Na Wakino Nation, uh, uh, which um, uh, speaks volumes to the way in which your community uh, uh, um, value your your role and your presence. So uh, thank you for being here today uh, and uh, congratulations on, on uh, having a very strong support for uh, the uh, conservation for this year. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to you uh, for your uh, your presentation. Uh, questions will will be collected in the chat and uh, we'll, uh, we'll harvest those uh, a little bit of an interactive uh, session after this. And I note that you proposed a title uh, of managing resources for the environment rather than human consumption of profit. So you'll, you'll have a very engaging opportunity here to connect with your immediate audience today. Uh, and I'm looking forward to, um, uh, to uh, your words. So over to you, Danielle, and thank you for being here. Thank you, Peter. Um, yeah, this is I'm I'm a little bit nervous. I haven't um I haven't done a, a presentation like this, and I, I'm it's it's mainly verbal. I don't have any sort of um, slideshow or anything like that. But I think that if we can have, you know, I'll I'll talk a bit, and then we can have a bit of an engagement afterwards. If there's any questions um, for me or about any of the content, um, then that would be great. Hello, everybody. Um, nice to. Um, be here with everybody and thank you for for logging in today in this new normal that is this COVID world where we're all sitting in our homes on our computers. Um, definitely a little bit different and I'd love to be in person with all you guys, but that's just not possible. So hopefully in the future. Um, yeah, so a, just a really brief background. Um, I was actually just recently um, elected as chief counselor of the Wikinook Nation, which is in Rivers Inlet on the central coast of British Columbia. Prior to um, being elected as chief counselor, I have worked with my nation in many roles um, around marine conservation, including um, the um, the marine use planning coordinator and the director of the integrated resource stewardship office for the Wikino Nation. Um, and so, interestingly enough, my background, my educational background is actually within business. I went, I attended Capilano University in their School of Business and um, had originally intended to be more of an entrepreneur. Um, but once working with my nation and, um, and, and learning a little bit about, you know, some of the um, challenges that, that we've been facing in terms of conservation, I, I couldn't help but dive right in. And um, so I've had many years of experience working within conservation. So I kind of bring to the table, I guess, a bit of a hybrid between um, economy and a need for industry, but also um, that there should be a balanced approach between um, conservation and, um, and the economy and that, that we can I think that we can achieve both. Um, so, um, so it's, which which makes my my topic today interesting. That um, it's mainly about managing resources with the ecosystem as a whole in mind, rather than traditionally the way that man resources. And I don't like the word resources because it it tends to show that species and the environment are only there for human consumption and for profit and that if there is a species that is not necessarily um, something that somebody would eat or harvest that it's not something that we need to kind of take care of or manage um, so i've i've worked with we and we 
we work in collaboration with the Central Coast Indigenous Resource Alliance and with Coastal First Nations um, on a number of initiatives, including the Marine Planning Partnership with the provincial government, which was signed um, several years ago. We're in year five of implementation of that. And that is a very proactive but balanced approach to protections along the coast, which also takes into account um, um, economic uses such as aquaculture, um, such as um, energy, clean energy, um, and several other uses that, that we could be taking into account and planning for those in the marine environment. We're currently working on um, a marine protected area network along the coast with the federal government, with DFO, um, and a number of other initiatives. So. As as most people know, who have who are most mainly here today, probably is that there's been a global shift with um, global warming and with climate change away from high consumption and um, fast industry with that the industrial revolution brought in um, towards the use of more sustainable materials and repurposing items such as shopping bags and water bottles and straws. Um, this movement also brings to light many of the traditional resource practices and the traditional stewardship that First Nations have practiced for millennia and have also, you know, had a challenge recently struggled with to implement with um, other government agencies sometimes. <laughs> um, and so, you know, as First Nations have pushed for some more sustainable management practices, there's often been um, this general common misconception that First Nations um, fighting for conservation are mainly fighting for exclusive harvest abilities through conservation. Um, when in reality, the thinking, the, sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. The, um, in reality, you know, we, we do have as First Nations, although we do have an exclusive right to harvest, with every right comes an equal responsibility, and we take that responsibility quite, um, you know, it's it's a very heavy responsibility to carry, and we take it quite seriously. And so, you know, we're always engaging with our elders and engaging with knowledge holders to ensure that our management practices and our harvesting practices are sustainable and responsible. But that sometimes comes to head with um, some external harvesting practices and causes as is timely with some of the things that are in the, the news lately, you know, sometimes that that doesn't exactly mesh well with um, some of the more Western harvesting practices. So the way that First Nations um, have seen the, this responsibility is that it's a responsibility to the entire ecosystem, regardless of if there are species that we harvest or that we eat or um, or anything, because there, the way that, you know, the way that the ecosystem works is that there's always going to be a species that depends on another species that depends on another species and they all live within, um, you know, certain habitats together. And if you throw that off balance with one species, it throws off another species and has um, kind of a domino effect within the marine environment. Um, so, and, and we also understand that we contribute to the ecosystem. And so we have a choice whether or not that impact is going to be positive or negative. So if the entire ecosystem is cared for, then human needs will in turn be met. Um, whereas if we're managing things specifically for human consumption and specifically for profitability and the economy, then we're just slowly and slowly depleting these resources. Um, and so that's where that balance comes in. That's really needed. Um, and so some of the ways that, um, our 1st, na like, some of the ways that local 1st nations are managing these practices is, um, for example, uh, we manage our FSC fishery, which is food, social and ceremonial. So we manage that, um, fishery internally. Um, and so this year, unfortunately, our sockeye stocks on the Wanak River in Rivers Inlet, off of Rivers Inlet, was a historic low, um, which is really hard given um, COVID and given food security. 
um, and that uncertainty, but we had to make the hard decision to close that fishery. It is closed to, to commercial fishery, but we had to make the decision to close the fishery to um, we can hook people as well um, for much of the season to ensure that um, that stock has a chance to strengthen and rebuild itself, um, even though it meant that many of our families and many of our people are now moving into the fall and winter without, you know, a pantry full of jarred sockeye that they normally would. Um, which would normally get some families through the through the winter. Um, we also have noticed a decline in um, crab stocks, and so we've been collaborating with um, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans on a collab collaborative collaborative working group, um, which has a three tiered approach with a technical working group towards. Um, a shift in management practices um, and a series of closures along the central coast proposed closures at this point and indigenous laws closures in which we um, we monitor and enforce and implement um, and um, obviously like I mentioned map the marine planning partnership so that has a good balance between um, the economy and conservation and um, really tries to reach, you know, both needs and um, understand that um, there's a need for commercial fisheries, there is a need for recreational fisheries, but then there's also a need for um, conservation areas and protected areas. Um, we along the Central Coast also have a, um, a bear DNA program and through that bear DNA program, um, which is more terrestrial, we have um, been collecting um, hair samples for DNA to show mainly where what bears have been eating and how many bears we have in our territory and where they travel to. But it also has brought about a really interesting um, uh, program that shows us how much fish bear need the bear the bears need to survive the winter so that we can take that into account when we're managing our fisheries. So we're not managing the fisheries specifically for human consumption. Like I said, we're taking into account the needs of other wildlife um, in order to make it through the winter as well. Um, and you, as you mentioned, Peter, um, we have the Guardian Watchman program. We are, are one of the nations that has a Guardian Watchman program. And so those Guardian Watchmen, they go um, about nine months out of the year, and they um, they patrol the, the territory, but they also do um, trap surveys to see where certain traps are being um, set and how much and how often, so that we can monitor that. Um, they are the ones that are enforcing our um, our traditional crab closures. Um, they watch out for vessel sightings and wildlife sightings and engage with people within our territories um, and have a really strong educational piece um, because in compliance and enforcement, compliance really comes forward with information and education and hopefully do well with education and information that there's less of a need for enforcement. Um, of, of regulations or of traditional laws. So we're really proud of our Guardian Watchmen program. Um, they work really well with BC Parks um, and with DFO agents. And um, they are anybody who called into the, the call or, or logged into the, the panel last week would have seen that they have um, what's called a coast tracker, which um, logs everything that they do and everywhere that they go. Um, and then that informs our management practices and that informs our um, policies and our regulations and our traditional laws. Um, and then that informs the discussions that we then bring back to um, other government agencies, such as DFO, such as Transport Canada, um, BC Parks, and um, with our own management plans. And so um, 
So there's definitely a lot of work being done um, by First Nations, and I, I really hope that you know through these processes we can um, implement them, implement some of these same management practices coast wide. Because, like I said, and I've said for the past you know 15 minutes or so, that it's mainly about you know a balance. There's there's there has to be a balance. So a balance between protections and economy. And this can be achieved through sustainable and responsible management practices and looking at some of the ways that things may have been traditionally managed and maybe understanding that there needs to be a shift in some places. Um, and that although it's great to have reusable straws and reusable water bottles, um, that there's more to it, there's more to um, you know, taking care of this world that we live on and the environment that we rely upon and the ecosystem and understanding that we're not outside of that ecosystem. We're a part of that ecosystem. Um, and so how. So, so our impacts on that every day out on the water. Um, and, you know, to me, this, these, this is kind of some very basic information and I'm sure that some people um, who who are on here today with us um, would feel the same way. But unfortunately to, you know, some people, the things that I've said today are, are actually quite radical and, um, and uh, you know, people think that that's, that that comes in um, conflict with commercial fisheries. Um, or fish farms, but I think that there's a way to look at things and to achieve um, all these objectives um, on some level, as long as we can kind of look at, we can come together with some collaboration, um, different levels of government, um, different levels of industry can come together and collaborate and um, meet our common objectives and then work through um, anywhere where maybe we don't see eye to eye. Um, I know I've only been speaking for about 15 minutes, um, but I'm I'm curious to see if there's anything that you know people would want to kind of chat more about or hear more about, and if we can kind of maybe get some conversation going. Um, and and yeah, that's that's pretty much it for my presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Danielle. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I think a lot of, of what's happening with these uh, these teams, WebEx, Zoom events is, you know, communication and contact with others, with the audience is different and it's very difficult to talk to an audience online. So thank you for making it very personable. You're you're there, you're present and uh, uh, you're, you're witness to all of the things and or you you are experiencing within community uh, i'll wait for um, a, a second or i'll start out the questions uh, from my perspective if i may uh, and uh, ask you are do you consider yourself an optimist then all the craziness out there in terms of climate change and the environment and weird politics and things that are going on in canada and international do you consider yourself an optimist and if so how how would you describe yourself, or how do you how do you um, you know see the beauty uh, through the trees, so to speak? Well, hmm, that is an unexpected question. Um, in in some ways, you know, I like to as as I've mentioned, I've tried to kind of keep things a little bit more upbeat and say, you know, we can do this, and we can we can find some real common grounds um, and everything. So overall, I like to think that if you keep plugging away, if you keep, you know, working hard and, you know, keep focused, take care of yourself um, and, and make some good choices um, for yourself and for others that that overall that kind of spreads and that is is kind of contagious, right? The energy that we give off is contagious to those around us and those that we come come across. So it's important to keep a level of optimism um but in reality you know it's it's really difficult to keep that um to keep an optimistic uh viewpoint a lot of the times when 
these same processes, these same collaborations can sometimes take years to see any kind of results. And a lot of the times, you know, one of the things that I have to keep reminding myself is that work within um, environmental stewardship and work within conservation, many times there's no tangible benefits that are immediate and we live in a world right now where a lot of the time we're wanting to see what is the immediate impact of this um what did we achieve now and i want to see it in my hands but i just keep reminding myself that this is something that um you know my children and my grandchildren are going to have some of hopefully have some of the same opportunities that i've had and that my mother has had um over the years in terms of um you know just in terms of you know being able to enjoy the the world as we see it now and that's how we do it um, is through the work that we have now and so understanding that this may be something that i might not even see in my lifetime or we'll see in 30 40 years from now see the the impacts of the work that we do now um so sometimes that makes it hard to kind of see it's hard to to be um to have that positive attitude to it when it's when you it just kind of seems like you're chugging along and fighting along um to not really have those tangible um those tangible impacts right at your hands um so yes and no i guess <laughs> yeah i think you you point out to the the uh today's era of a click of a ordering uh on amazon or ebay or getting your answers via, via wikipedia or google everybody either expects or wants an answer or a product today or tomorrow and a lot of people just lose patience or lose sight of the future generations and that's a huge challenge i think for us uh, all around the world um got a question here um for you and that is a fairly simple one how important how connected is your community to the ocean Oh, well, we, um, our community is located on the Wannock River, um, and the Wannock River feeds into Rivers Inlet, which opens up into the Pacific Ocean. And so we, we practically live, most of our territory is actually marine environment, and we practically live more on the water than we do um, in the terrestrial environment. And we explore throughout our territory and harvest throughout our territory more along the marine environment than we do um on the terrestrial environment so very very um connected to the water um as i think as coastal peoples and as coastal nations and you know when i'm when i this is applicable to my nation but also a lot of the things that i talk about is um is it connects to british columbians and canadians in general because we can canada has three coastlines and bc is along the, the pacific ocean and so we most of us live near the water or along the water or rely on the water and so um you know a lot of the work that we do and a lot of the work that we do with the the provincial government and the and the federal government is is not just for it's not like the work i do isn't just for we people it's it's um it's for everybody. Great, thank you. And uh, yeah, I think that that question of being a, a resident of, uh, of a coastal community is it speaks volumes, and particularly with the more remote remote location. So you're bearing witness to the the return, whether it's good or bad, uh, of uh, sockeye salmon to the river. Uh, you're looking at uh, ups and downs of shellfish beds. You're you're seeing firsthand what might be going on, and some of that might be caused by external factors like climate change or ocean acidification. Let alone sort of uh, you know high seas fisheries or, or other direct uh, means of impact. So those are very very important in my view from a Western science perspective. Those are very important uh, ways of 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 witnessing or gathering insight into what's going on. And as you know, we have Western science and traditional knowledge, and I think there's a, a beautiful uh, synergy between the two because what's important to community might be undocumented from a Western science perspective. I think that sense of, of being a coastal community connected to the ocean gives your your uh, 
uh, your uh, friends, colleagues, uh, uh, family members, uh, a very important role uh, to making sure that people in Victoria or Ottawa or Vancouver or Toronto uh, uh, have a set of eyes on the ocean. And uh, so thank you for that. And uh, uh, please do remain optimistic. We need your energy. Uh, I have a question here from the audience. Preserving salmon for the winter is an unfamiliar concept to many. Uh, so what impact would losing that food and or process have on the community? And you see the sockeye salmon uh, uh, crisis this year. Uh, maybe you can speak to, um, actually to start that off, the different methods of salmon preparation uh, and storage, and then uh, what, what, how important salmon is to community and what does uh, a decline uh, translate to in terms of uh, community? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I guess um, Weekinook is a very remote community. Um, we in a very small community. So the only access into the community is via um, float plane or water taxi. We don't have ferry or road access. And there isn't a, a grocery store on site. Um, there there's like I said, it's a very small community. So a lot of the people, if you need to get groceries in, you need to order them from neighboring communities, mostly Port Hardy, and then pay to have those groceries um, flown in or brought in on the boat. Throughout the winter time, I guess I didn't start off with traditional practices, but I will do that in a second. Um, throughout the winter time, um, travel into the community becomes quite treacherous. And so it's becomes few and far between that we're able to get boats or planes into our community. And so you kind of need to make sure that you have any amenities that you might need on hand um, because you can't just drive down to the grocery store and pick something up if that's what you need for dinner. Um, so there's a lot of preparation that is necessary um, to ensure that you're um, you have all your needs, but also that you're comfortable and 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 well fed and and um, and everything throughout the winter throughout these these winter months. So, um, a lot of the things that we do is we um, will will smoke a lot of um, salmon sometimes, sometimes sockeye, sometimes spring in different ways. Like we, we can make um, what's called candy and that's more with like a, um, a brown sugar mixture that's kind of a little bit sweeter and a little bit of a treat because it's a lot of processing. It's a lot of, you cut it up into tiny little strips you cut the fish up into little strips and then you put it into a brine. Um, I usually do it overnight. Um, and then dry it out a bit and then smoke it. Um, and then you can do um, really, really, really smoked fish um, that um, you can then, it's, it ends up being really dry and kind of flaky and it's a good snack, but it's also really good later on. It's a good preservation method because later on you can then put it into a broth for soup um, or for stews um, or mix it within um, rice. And so there's a couple different methods of smoking um, that is becomes really 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 tasty um but are really practical for um storage um and then the the main method that people use is mainly to um can or jar um sockeye and so that's using a um a water bath or sometimes a pressure cooker um and you know cutting up the fish and and um Putting it into jars, I'll put, you know, a bit of salt and a bit of vinegar in mainly to kind of soften up the bones and give it a bit. Just a, a little bit more um, extra preservation uh, and then so once those jars and cans are all sealed, then you can stick them on in your pantry on the shelves for. For however long you need to and um, take those out. So we take out a jar for for dinner to have with rice um, or potatoes or to have in sandwiches um, to make um, salmon patties with um, with potatoes, all different ways. Um, or sometimes I'll just make little make some fillets, cut it up into fillets and then um, vacuum pack and, and freeze them. And so going back to what I was saying, there's there's other things that we do, like like I sometimes will actually can and jar crab. Um, we harvest um, seaweed in the spring and dry that and then bag that up to have that on hand. Um, 
if we have an Ooligan run, we will um, hopefully like Ooligan are kind of one of those fish that again, they're not one that a lot of um, there's a big industry for, but they're very important to our people. And so um, they're not really managed well and due to different factors, um, climate change, but then also bycatch of commercial fisheries, um, the a lot of Ooligan stocks have been almost wiped out. So if we're lucky enough to get an Ooligan run, which happens sometimes every 10 or 20 years, um, we'll make what's called grease, some Ooligan grease, which is very nutrient rich. Um, if I feel myself getting sick, I'll have a spoonful of Ooligan grease and it'll totally clear everything up. Um, and put that into soup or, um, or on rice or pretty much with anything. Some people kind of use it like they use ketchup. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, traditional preservation, uh, practices that, like I said, get us through the winter because, um, because of exactly that, like I said, so it's really hard to get groceries in at the best of times, um, to put things into perspective on the plane in order to get groceries in on the plane um it's a it's over a dollar a pound and that's on top of the cost of groceries so you've already spent however much you've spent on groceries to probably for about a two week you know you want to have at least a two weeks um supply on hand and um and you so you spend a few hundred dollars on groceries and then it's over a dollar a pound so a 20 pound bag of potatoes which at the store is going to cost you about six dollars also costs you an additional twenty dollars in freight so now that six dollar bag of potatoes is costing you 26 dollars and a gallon of milk is now costing you um you know, 10, $15. And so that all adds up. Sometimes you pay more in freight than you do for the actual groceries. And I mean, we all know that you can, it's sometimes it's just hard. Sometimes it's hard to pay the bills and to, to um, whether you're working hard or not to, to make sure that you have enough groceries on hand. And a lot of people work paycheck to paycheck. I would think that most people work paycheck to paycheck. And so when you add in an additional cost, Every two weeks, that's another few hundred dollars. Um, it can be, uh, it can, it can make or break your winter. Um, but then also, say you have three or four kids at home and your groceries don't come in for four days, and all you have is rice and onions and the things that kind of keep a little bit better, and you don't have any of the fresh stuff. Then that's where um, the supply of the traditional foods really comes in handy. Thanks for that. Well, may you and your uh, uh, your neighbors and friends and family to uh, uh, an abundance of healthy uh, local indigenous uh, foods or, or marine resources uh, as you see fit. Obviously, that would reduce the reliance on those supermarket uh, those distant supermarkets at the cost, and and probably help out from a, from a health and, and social standpoint. So, uh, uh, hoping that that access uh, continues to grow and and be protected by. By everyone uh, in um, in the region, uh, I have a question here from the audience. Uh, do you work with youth in your community, um, and um, to what extent are those youth engaged in initiatives and or a way of thinking that perhaps aligns with uh, what you've been able to uh, to learn over the course of your life? Uh, and what is resonating with youth um, uh, in community right now? Are they engaged? Are they uh, are they disengaged? Are they worried? Are they active? Are they? Do you see some really exciting new minds uh, developing uh, out there in the wings that uh, that will help out um, in this more sustainable future, uh, et cetera? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, so, um, so a couple things. So, for one, we can know is um, unfortunately we only have a elementary school. We don't have a high school, so most of the um, the youth in their teenage years will move to a neighboring community or to Port Hardy or to another place, either with their family or to move with another family member for their high school years. Um, so that age group, there's kind of a gap in the school year. Um, in the, in the community, but we do still have our elementary school and we do still have young adults who move home um, for various reasons, especially just because it's home. 
So the way that we engage with them, especially within stewardship, is a number of ways. Um, we have hired on um, what we call junior guardians. And so junior guardians are usually um, a couple of youth each year who, um, you know, they get the uniform. And if there's training um, available that season, they get to participate in the training. And it's... Um, it's employment for them and a training opportunity for them. And they get it to go out on the water and be mentored by our guardian watchman crews um, and learn how to use the coast tracker and learn the territory and hear the stories by some of the older guardian watchmen who have been doing the work for a long time and been out on the water for a long time. Um, and I think through the guardian watchman program is mainly is one of our biggest things that the youth see. They see the guardian watchmen, again, like I said, in their uniforms, it really has a big impact on them to see them in their uniforms and um, and to see the work that they do. And so a lot of the time you hear youth say, I want to be a guardian watchman when I grow up. So, um, so we really try to make sure that we provide that opportunity with them um, so that they can see exactly what goes into the job and they can, you know, get a taste for it, um, and get their, their foot in the door. It, it's something that they can add to their resume, um, and some work experience for them as well. Another way that we engage the youth is through, um, a summer youth program. And we do that in collaboration. The stewardship office does that in collaboration with the health department. Um, and so they hire, um, a youth program coordinator. And we actually bring um, some of our youth from outside communities. Um, we've brought youth from Bella Bella, from Port Hardy, Vancouver, all over the island. If there's an interest and they have somewhere that they can stay with family in the village, then we will do what we can to bring them home for the summer. And um, during that, it's an eight-week program, and during that eight-week program, they um, they will participate in um, in the fisheries program. They help to um, harvest and deliver fish to elders or to community members. Um, they will then learn how to um, how to uh, clean a fish, how to jar fish, um, and then they get to go home with their own case of jarred fish that they did themselves. Um, they go berry picking and then bring those berries to, um, to some of our elders or some of the community members who make jam or whatnot. Um, and then there's also opportunities for them to get out on the water. So they go camping at some of our, um, you know, some of our harvest spots, such as um, a place called Clam Beach, where we um, dig for clams and mussels and stuff. And a lot, most of the camping trips actually happen with the Guardian Watchmen. So the Guardian Watchmen will go camping with them. Um, and then we'll take them out in small groups throughout the day um, as one of the activities. Um, to either go fishing or to go on a patrol or to go look for wildlife. Um, they get to go and stay at um, the Hakai Research Institute, which is located on Calvert Island. Um, so they get to stay. We're, we're very lucky to have a, um, a good relationship with the Tula Foundation. And so they um, host our youth at the Hakai Research Institute um, every summer. And so they get to go and um, you know, check out the beaches and um, and have a good, you know, a neat camping trip. They go up to um, the, uh, we usually, you know, make our way up to Quay, which is um, along the, the coast as well. So different areas within the territory that so that they get to kind of see the territory, whether they live in the community or not. Um, and they get to do that with the Guardian Watchmen. So they get to kind of see the Guardian Watchmen in action. Um, and then, um, you know, most years we try to get them into the big house to learn some dances. Um, there's been a couple of years where they've been able to um, kind of host their own mini potlatch. So they learn a couple dances and then they present those dances to the community um, and hand out the, the fish and the berries that they picked and stuff. And so then they see um, what they learn and see what the potlatch um, is all about. Um, and so the main thing is, obviously, this is for children that are in the community, and it's a really great program for children in the community, but it's a really great opportunity for um, we can know youth who um, don't have the opportunity to live in the community, but then they can also learn about our culture and our territory. Wonderful. That sounds uh, quite vibrant. Uh, thank you for that. I'm um, just wondering, Danielle, um, we 
lot about reconciliation uh, these days. Uh, it, it's really uh, almost exploded onto the scene uh, politically in Canada and British Columbia over the last uh, few years. Um, and of course, there's a lot of history, a lot of baggage, some of it out of sight, out of mind, some of, some of it a long time ago, some of it more recent. I wonder, is, is there a story you'd be willing to share with the audience today about your a sense of what reconciliation means and, and where we might as cohabitating uh, humans be headed on, on the, the spirit of reconciliation. Is there any story that you'd be willing to share or speak to? Mm -hmm. um, I guess there's a couple of uh, examples that I can share. I guess first I'll, I'll um, disclose we are, um, so we are, uh, it within the treaty process right now. And so we're negotiating uh, a treaty with the federal and provincial governments. Um, and that is um, in final stages of treaty at this point. Um, so that really reflects um, the work that we do towards reconciliation and, and everything. And, and I think within reconciliation, you know, a huge part of reconciliation is, um, is ensuring that um, uh, First Nations people have um, sovereignty and management um, over their territory. And so that there's very meaningful, it's actual meaningful management practices and meaningful seats at the table um, when it comes to management practices within, within the territory. Um, and, and again, the management practices are not when we say management practices and we're trying to say that we'd like to, you know, have conservation measures here, or we'd like to, um, beef up certain management practices, um, in different areas for responsible and sustainable, um, harvesting practices. It's not so that our people always, so that our people can have more, <laughs> more of the resource, but also so that the resource, um, isn't always in this state of a frenzy state of adapting because they're never, um, in a healthy, there's never healthy stocks available for them to really thrive. Um, so we'd like to kind of get to a point where, like I said, our ecosystem is, is healthy enough that, um, that all the species that rely on the ecosystem. Um, are able to just um, live as they naturally were meant to live. And then that way, hopefully human needs can be met as well. Um, so I alluded to a crab process that we, um, that we are a part of with DFO and that um, came to light mainly because we were having a lot of problems um, a, a number of years ago, a lot of problems with crab management and we were seeing, so we've been doing, um, we've been conducting crab research through our guardian watchmen and in collaboration with the central coast indigenous resource Alliance, which is, um, includes the, the health sick nation, the Kinesu Heihase and the new Hulk nation and ourselves, the weekend nation. And, um, so we conduct every six weeks crab surveys throughout our territories, and we were identifying um, a serious decline in crab stocks within these areas and finding that regardless of the data that we were um, that we were able to show, nothing was changing in terms of harvesting practices and managing crab management practices in terms of recreational and commercial fisheries. and. It got to a point where we kind of started to have to take things into our own hands and enforce closures ourselves. And of course, that really creates, um, I like to call it almost like the Wild West because we're sitting here going, no, you can't fish here. Um, DFO is saying, well, technically they can fish there. And then fishermen are kind of caught in the middle because they're going, well, what do we do? Um, and so, um, it got to a point where we realized that we really, you know, especially in the spirit of reconciliation, we really needed to start working together here and we needed to bring our information together, bring our data together and, um, and find some, a real common ground. And unfortunately, um, it was a really powerful day <laughs> for our nations. Um, and it was probably one of my, it was, it's, it's a story that I tell quite often that we were in a meeting and nobody on either side of the table was happy with what, what the outcome was. Um, you know, First Nations, our nations were saying, we're going to enforce these closures. And that means that um, 
we're going to be telling people to stay out of these areas and that that our guardian watchmen are going to be out there and if we need to pull these traps we'll be pulling these traps and dfo is saying you can't do that and let's let's work together but also they were also saying um but we can't do any of these closures so you know and that's a very basic kind of overview of what was happening there was obviously it was obviously a lot more comprehensive than that and i'm not going to go into it too much but um it got to a point where we just kind of everybody just kind of stopped and we said okay well we're not okay with that we're going to go pull traps now bye and we turned around and, and left the meeting and um created a bit of a scramble but also because it had come to such a head um but all parties realized there needs to be a better way of doing this this isn't achieving what anybody wants to achieve this isn't working together um so we created what's called the crab collaborative um, working group and we have a technical working group um, we have a steering committee for policy directives and then we have an executive committee where um, each level of leadership sits at mainly for dispute resolution and for decision making and we've been in that process for um, the past four years now and now that um, structure is being used it was it that program is now being used as a pilot to pilot what's called the fisheries reconciliation framework agreement and so um, a number of coastal first nations have signed on with the federal government towards um, fisheries reconciliation which will bring a lot more capacity along the coast um, to uh, fisheries conservation and to the um, the economy with around fisheries and um so now we're using the same uh, much of the same model from this crab process um within the fisheries reconciliation framework agreement um and it's a very collaborative process and um we meet very often and we're all just trying to kind of find that common ground and um and and find some management processes and you know there there is some give and take and there's some compromise on all sides but i think that that's going to be a part of any real healthy collaborative process no matter what industry you're working in um so i think when i think of reconciliation you know it's understanding that um you know we're all here i think we all want British Columbia and Canada and, you know, all of our nations to be um, healthy and to be thriving and for our environment and our ecosystems to be healthy and thriving. Um, so it's, it's really working together to, um, to make that happen. Well, thanks for that. Well, it takes a lot of uh, strength, a lot of courage to uh, stand ground uh, in, in the spirit of keeping those uh, those topics uh, on the solution oriented path. So uh, hats off to you and the community for that. Um, as the clock is ticking here, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just see if anybody else online uh, wants to weigh in either in the chat room with an additional question or, uh, or uh, 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 feel free to open up and maybe I'll pro I'll invite an audience member to um, to let us know if they've tasted Ulik and Grace before, and if so, what was their uh, what was their first experience? So I'm looking for. Uh, I don't know if we have any community members um, uh, online right now, but we probably have some non-European, uh, non-community, uh, uh, more European or Asian origin uh, originating uh, folks. So anybody uh, tasted Ulik and Grace, and if so, let's hear about it right now. Or if you've smelled it. <laughs> Maybe no one. Mm. That's the disadvantage to online meetings. We can't embark on a taste test. I've, I've certainly tasted it. It is an acquired taste. Uh, and uh, I know Rivers Inlet does have a, a, a proud history of, uh, of preparing a lick and grease. So hopefully the runs are doing okay. I know that they're under pressure up and down the coast, but hopefully. Uh, uh, the Olican uh, uh, production will uh, will continue. Um, tell me, uh, uh, Danielle, um, are there known uh, Olican trails uh, nearby your community that you're aware of? Um, because I understand it was one of a handful of uh, very heavily traded products with uh, the interior uh, in the past, sort of, sort of pre-contact and possibly early post-contacts. Aware of any Olican uh, trails? Yeah, I know of at least one. There's one that kind of connects. Uh, we can. Uh -huh with um, South Bentic, which is in um, New Hulk territory, and um, and where um, 
uh, New Hope people, specifically the Talio family, um, would meet to trade with, uh, with Wikinook people, um, especially the people who traditionally lived um, up the lake at uh, Schumholt. Marvelous. It's such an interesting uh, history of uh, sort of uh, bringing the ocean and its bounty onto land and then uh, into uh, a cultural uh, context and then into this geographical terrestrial geographic perspective of trading uh, with neighbors, et cetera. It's, it's really absolutely fascinating and I wish more people would be interested and or aware, but uh, we are winding down here. I think we might have uh, one more question stand by. I can't quite see it. Uh, okay, so I have a question here for Valeria. Uh, how has the handling of COVID-19 regulations by the federal government uh, impacted your community and the kinds of decisions that need to be made, for example, around sharing resources? COVID-19 and the federal and provincial government's response to it. Any, any thoughts there, Daniel? Um, yeah, I think some of the most challenging things that we've run into with COVID-19 um, have been around, you know, some of the decisions that were made um, to open up certain industries that impacted our remote communities. We have very, very limited access to um, very limited health resources, um, and we don't have any sort of hospital or anything within our community. So we really need to be very careful. It's where our um, more isolated kind of situation has really served us in that way that we've been able to close the community to people and um, and make sure that you know we really focus on the health and safety of our community members and of our um, of our people. Um, but there was a bit of a scramble there when um, there were certain industries that you know, that were opened up that allowed people to travel throughout the province. Um, but we were able to, you know, to work directly with industry and with the province to make sure that um, our community was kind of still kept isolated in that way. So that's been um, that's been been extremely fortunate and we'll see. I mean, we're not out of the woods, right? So um, we'll see as things move forward. But food security has been one of the biggest um, challenges that we've had. And with declining stocks and us, you know, seeing the impacts of that this season, we'll see how that impacts us over the winter. Um, but when there was very little access to food within grocery stores or limited, they were limiting the amount of things that people were able to get at grocery stores. Um, it was extremely important that our community members were still able to travel throughout our territory and harvest as needed. So, because they weren't able to access things at the grocery store. Well, very interesting. Uh, well, uh, it's a very, um, interesting time that we live in um, for all the weird and wonderful and awful ways uh, that uh, that are manifesting themselves uh, in the news we read about them but uh, Danielle thank you for a delightful uh, engagement here with online today for this um, this uh, high uh, rich approach to our online uh, to our uh, ocean awards uh, congratulations again on your ocean award uh, conservation uh, and I hope that it helps you uh, with family, friends, colleagues um, at various uh, working group levels uh, to uh, succeed in uh, taking care of uh, uh, your backyard uh, and the wider ocean. Uh, so I wish you uh, all the best in that room. I wish you a happy, safe, and sane winter uh, with uh, with good access to the foods that you're talking about, um, and that all all your family members and friends stay uh, stay safe. It's uh, I think everyone's a little bit apprehensive about the winter and, and I know remote communities have uh, that added uh, uh, constraint of uh, access uh, to transportation and or resources from outside uh, from beyond. So thanks very much for your time. Uh, I'm uh, uh, congratulations. I'm just going to uh, put a plug in for the, the next few Ocean Award winners. Next week we have Dr. Philippe Tortel from UBC's uh, uh, Department of Earth, Ocean Atmosphere. Sciences uh, is the award winner for uh, uh, for research, um, and then on October the fifteenth, we have uh, Dr. Brett Howard who will be receiving the who has received the big award for uh, uh, student research. 
Uh, and then um, on October the 22nd, we've got Dr. Tom Dakin uh, getting an award uh, for conservation technology. Uh, and finally, Dr. Alejandro Frid will be getting the communications award for conservation on October the 29th. So, uh, Danielle, thank you for opening up the sluices uh, on the two uh, preeminent awards, the, uh, the conservation and research awards. So this week, uh, conservation. And uh, thank you to the online uh, audience. Um, that was a lot of fun and um, more. So Danielle, thanks again very much and uh, take care of yourself. Thank you. You as well. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Bye.